And I want to read you from John chapter 15, and it says, Remain in me, and I in you. Just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains on the vine, neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit, because you can do nothing without me. As the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. Amen? Yeah. And so I'm looking forward to just making our joy complete today as we seek his face and seek his will. And so I'm just going to ask if Sonia would go ahead and open us with a word of prayer, and then she's going to lead us in worship. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the right to be able to assemble and worship you and praise you for all that you do for us during the week. We ask that you open our ears, open our hearts to everything today that you have in store for us. And we ask that you touch all of our bodies, hearts, and minds with your power and your might and your great love. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please turn to page 124, hymnal.
756 An oldie but a goodie Oh, 
in honor of the blood that was shed for our salvation, I wore my red shirt today. <laughs> and I got just enough Indian in me that I like red anyway. <laughs> Shall we pray? Father, we have gathered here today in celebration of your great glory, of which we can only get bits and glimpses of as your spirit reveals. <laughs> but we look forward to the day when we shall see you face to face and bow in homage in reality in the presence of your glory. You are God. There is none that is like you. You're all powerful. You're all knowing. And you're everywhere. In our hearts, we know that you long for all who draw our breath to come to repentance. It's a prayer of our hearts as well. So may we be obedient to your calling on us as we go about the business you have set before us. Again, Lord, we give you praise and glory and honor. And as we come to the table, Lord, cause us to remember what you have done for us. Pardon me. In the past, I've spoken words to you regarding what happened to Christ. And he spoke about that at his Last Supper. But I thought it prudent that I not only quote to you the words that he has given to us regarding that matter. But I thought it was quite appropriate that I would bring the impetus of the word by reading it to you out of the scripture. First Corinthians 11, starting at verse 23. Paul speaking. For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take eat, for this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After that, after the same manner, he also took the cup, which when he had supped, saying, this is the, this cup is the New Testament in my blood.
This do ye as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. For this, for as often as ye eat of this bread and drink of this cup, do, you do show that death, Lord's death, until he come. And that's what we look forward to even today. So you have, hopefully in your hands, a cup and the top layer has a bread element. Come on, fingers work. And just as he did that night, he broke it. Shall we break it together and partake? Uh, Lord, thank you. Thank you, God. And then the second layer, you will find the fruit of the vine underneath. I find the symbolism of these two elements more profound than just their appearance. Because the bread is a solid substance, much like our bodies. And the other element is a, is a liquid, just like his blood. Father God, we thank you that your son offered himself up on our behalf. And as his blood was shed, it was meant to cover our sins as we ask for forgiveness. So Lord, in symbolism, we partake of the blood. And when you pass over, you would see your son's blood and not judge. So we partake together. Thank you, God. You, Lord, have done so much. You have bring so much to the table and we bring so little. But we thank you for your graciousness that accepts us as we are when we come for forgiveness. You'll not turn another, any other away that wants that forgiveness. And I remember, Lord, when I asked for forgiveness, you didn't disappoint. So bless us, God, as we go through our rest of our day. May our ears hear your word. May our feet prepare to spread the gospel. May our mouths not hinder to share the word that Jesus saves. We give you the glory and the honor. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. papers lest they blow away and I just picked something out. Hold on one second. There. Stop that. Everybody Hi. awake now? Oh, that hurt. I'm good. Where am I next? Amen. Aren't you glad for the fact that God gave his only son yes. for us? But we're going to read about something even 
greater in, in a sense, that he didn't just stop there. Amen. So if you'll turn in your hymnals to number 545, we're going to read responsibly. As you read the words in bold, I will read the words that are in fine print. It starts off saying, God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. But join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Not because of anything we have done. You then be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, enduring hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Here's a trustworthy saying. If we died with him, if we endure, if we disown him, if we are faithless, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. Workman does not need to be ashamed who correctly handles the word of truth. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. How many know we cannot do that on our own strength? But praise God, he gave us his Holy Spirit to empower us. Amen? Amen. As Dottie passes the offering um, bag around and we continue to worship him with our tithes, with our offerings today, I also want to share some um, announcements with you. Of course, one of the biggest ones is, guys, only one more week here and then we move to our new facility over at the Senior Center. Amen, amen, amen. And with indoor plumbing and everything, you know, it's great. And uh, for those that do not know that might be tuning in on Facebook for the first time, our previous location, uh, we did not have uh, indoor bathroom. We had to go to a separate building, not an outhouse, praise God. At least we were one step up from that. But. We will now um, have everything under one roof, which is just absolutely awesome. But again, so we'll, our first Sunday there will be September 19th. And also with our um, starting at our new facility, the one thing that we will have that's a little bit of a drawback compared to where we were at with St. Luke's is there will be set up and tear down every week. Um, so if you are able to assist us with that, I will be over there by 830 every Sunday morning uh, working at getting things set up. So if you can help us with that, uh, we would encourage you and definitely welcome your ability in that. Or if you can't help us set up, maybe you can help us kind of tear down and disinfect and all that kind of good stuff before we leave. We always want to leave looking better than it was when we walked in. Amen? Yeah. So, All right, if you'll look, turn in your Bibles to Joshua chapter 3. We are actually starting a new series this morning called Journeys Through the Jordan, okay? You're going to find that the Jordan River, and we're all familiar with that. I mean, it's still around today. Um, but it was a very influential place throughout Scripture. And so I think it's very important for us to take a look at this. But even more than that today, I think it's very um, timely for us. If you may remember, when we first started meeting here that very first Sunday. Lord took us into a sermon um, for, I think it was one or two weeks, on wilderness wanderings. Remember that? And about how God has brought us that place. We've been brought out of Egypt, but we are in the wilderness. God has a promised land he wants to bring us to, which is a place of what? His prosperity, right? A place of his influence. It's not talking about heaven being Canaan land or the promised land. It's talking about in the here and the now. But for a season, we were going to be in a place of wandering. Okay? I think we are about to exit that. Okay? Not just geographically in our meeting here. Now, I'm not saying that the senior center is where we are going to be till Jesus comes. We may be. And if the world keeps going the way it's going, that's not going to be too far off anyway. Okay? But... The thing is, is I think that we are moving very strategically. We are stepping over a threshold. 
And that's a little bit of where God's, I think, wants us to go today and next week especially, is dealing with where are we right now as we stand at this new threshold, this new fork in the road, if you will. And so I want us to take a good look at this. And it says there, starting at verse 1 and going through verse 5, Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and they set out from Acacia Grove and came to the Jordan, he and all the children of Israel, and lodged there before they crossed over. So it was, after three days, that the officers went through the camp, and they commanded the people, saying, When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the priests, the Levites, bearing it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measure. Do not come near it, that you may know the way by which you must go, for you have not passed this way before. And Joshua said to the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Let's pray. God, we open ourselves up to your leading as we move forward. But God, today we also open up ourselves to hear your word to speak something fresh into the very fabric of who we are as a church body as well as individually. So God, would you come and have your way in our midst? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So as you can see here, the Israelites are finally ready to leave their wilderness wanderings. They're ready to cross the Jordan into the promised land. They received, obviously, some great news from a couple of spies. If you were to take this back to chapter 1, you'll find that it was there that Joshua first is told by the Lord that this is what he's going to do. He's going, they're going to go to the um, shores of the Jordan. They are going to wait there for three days, and then things, they would begin to move forward. In that time frame, though, of those few days, they had sent a couple of spies. You might remember these guys if you remember the story of Rahab. Okay, and they go in and they're lowered, they end up being, you know, lowered down uh, through her window, window um, in the basket on a scarlet uh, rope. And the news comes back, and it's very good news, that God has given us the land. And they are ready, the people are really ready to transition from their wilderness wandering into the inheritance that they have been waiting for for a very long time time. But now this is not the first time that this story tried to unfold, is it? This is not the first time that they found themselves ready to enter into the promised land. The last time you might remember was back in Numbers chapters 13 and 14. It happened some 40 years earlier. Remember, they were in the wilderness, they had come to Mount Sinai, they had been given the, the, the commandments from God, and God was going to lead them into the promised land. And if you'll remember, that at that time, they were getting prepped to do so. In fact, Moses sent some spies into the land as well. He sent a number of them, one from each tribe and Joshua. Okay? And when they got the report back, Two of the spies gave a good report. The others, however, not so good. In fact, they almost didn't only just not bring a good report, they worked at discouraging the people. And they did a really good job at it. Because it tells us there that Caleb actually had to quiet the people down. There, there was an uprising that was beginning to happen. That what is Moses thinking, thinking that we can take this land? What was the result? Well... It's not rocket science. They found themselves stuck in the wilderness. God said, this is where you're going to stay until y'all die off, except for the two that came back and gave the good report. Okay, that would be Caleb and Joshua. And so here we are at this point. But you might not be aware that what happened after they'd been told that you're going to have to wander for 40 years, because most pastors stop there. And, 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 they, and that's what they teach you. Well, they were, then they were stuck in the wilderness. But do you understand what Israel's response was after that? 
The way that Israel responded after that is they're like, we're sorry. We were bad kids. We don't want to be stuck here any longer. So we'll do what you told us to do. We'll go in. And God said, no, sorry, too late. You go now. It's on your own strength. In fact, we read that Moses and the ark did not go with them. And there's importance in that. And that's where this story differs. The ark, well, not Moses, but the ark goes with them because Moses at this point is no longer. God spoke, told them not to enter, but they did not heed it. They tried to enter anyway, still being those disobedient children they were so good at being. And the result was they were driven back. And so then 40 years pass, but yet during that time, God did not forget them, did he? During that time, we know that their shoe, their sandals and their clothing did not wear out. How many of you had any clothing that you wore day after day after day after day and it lasted for 40 years? It just don't happen. And so here they find themselves. They have experienced the presence of God. God still continues to provide for them. But now comes the day. Now comes that moment of being able to walk into that land. Because why? Our God is faithful. When God makes a promise, he will see it through. It might have to go on some detours once in a while, but he will always be faithful to see it through. And so in verse 1 here, we see that they are camped at the Jordan. It says, Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and they set out from Acacia Grove and came to the Jordan, he and all the children of Israel, and lodged there before they crossed over. So they can see the promised land. It's just over the river. And this ain't no big river either. Okay? In fact, if you were to try to do a size comparison of the Jordan River on a normal day, it is basically only about 90 to 100 feet wide. 90 to 100 feet. To give you a visual, how many know where the senior center is? That's the length of the senior center. Okay, this is not normally a huge river. And by the way, it's only about three to ten feet deep throughout. However, and you'll, we'll could talk more about this next week, this was no normal time. Because the river was at flood stage. And one thing we know about the Jordan River when it is flood stage, it is now no longer just 90 to 100 feet wide. It is now up to a mile wide. And not only that, it is also up to 150 feet deep. In fact, back in the 1800s, I think it was around 1854, there's an experienced expert swimmer that tried to swim it, and they could not. Well, hold it, it's less than a mile. But the problem is, the reason it is called the Jordan is the word means descending. In fact, the amount of elevation that it covers causes this to be one of the fastest rivers with one of the worst currents during that time frame especially. That's why they weren't able to cross. So for them to cross over was not going to be a small feat. This was not a matter of wade in and you might get a little wet. This is going to take you under if you try to do it on your own. So here they are. They're finally at the mouth of the Jordan, or at the banks of the Jordan, getting ready to cross into that promised land. They are willing to go wherever. They're willing to go whenever God leads, even if it means through the waters. Because what you'll find as we talk more about this next week even, that there's no complaining. There's no, Joshua, are you out of your mind? There's none of that kind of talk going on. When he said, this is what we're going to do, they went. Understand, these people never saw the Red Sea crossing. Remember, that whole generation has come and gone, except for Caleb and Joshua. Now, I'll guarantee you, they heard about it over and over and over again over the course of those 40 years, I'm sure. But they were not there. And so they were going to cross this for the first time. There's no comparing it. 
And even if they could compare it, they're going to find that it's going to happen just a little bit differently this time. They're going to be tested to a new level. Talk more about that next week. But here they are, they camped out at the river, and they knew that they were going to have to cross at some point. They weren't sure how it was going to happen, but they knew it was going to have to happen. They were just awaiting the orders. And they're not the only ones that find themselves awaiting orders at this river. See, the Jordan River, and the reason we're going to spend a number of weeks talking about this, because there's a lot of very important things that happened at this river. And every time you see something of God's anointing being poured out at, these, at this location, you see it here in the story of, you know, as Joshua now has assumed the role that Moses had assumed. You see it when Elisha, or Elisha, found himself at the Jordan and exhibiting the, anoint, the Elijah anointing that he had received. And then, of course, we also know that there's a little bit of a passing off of the anointing between John the Baptist and Jesus at this location. This is a very significant river. It's a very significant time for them. And can I tell you, anybody that ever finds themselves at the proverbial banks of the Jordan, as we as a church are right now, will find themselves in a place where God wants to exhibit something of his anointing upon his people. And I think that those are the days we're coming into. I don't know what that's going to look like. We're awaiting the orders. You know? But we're at the mount. We're at the banks of the Jordan here. And we're awaiting God to show us exactly how to move, when to move, and where to move. Looking at verses 2 through 4, it goes on to say, So it was after three days that the officers went through the camp and they commanded the people, saying, When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the priests, the Levites, bearing it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you, about 2,000 cubits by measure. Don't come near it, that you may know which way you must go, for you have not passed this way before. So what they are told to do is keep your eyes open for when the ark moves. Keep your eyes focused on when his, you know, those that are carrying the ark begin to move. He didn't give them any time frame, didn't say exactly when it was going to happen, but when it does, you better be aware, you better be ready to follow when it happens. We must always be in that attitude where we are always on the alert for when God is moving. However that is, wherever that is, and whenever that is. Even when sometimes it seems almost like it just doesn't seem quite right, God. Because you see, out of all the places for them to cross the Jordan, this was the widest section of the Jordan. Wouldn't it make more sense to cross where it's a little easier? See, a lot of times God tells you to do things that don't make sense. Like taking a church called Life on Main off Main. Right? And so, but you know what? It's not up to us to figure God out. It's just up to us to understand when it's his voice and to follow that voice. What they're saying in follow the ark when it moves is follow the presence of God wherever it takes you. Follow his presence. And it's going to lead you sometimes in places that you did not expect to have to go. In fact, he even tells them here, you better make sure you stay far enough back because it's, you're going to be going places you have not been before. And you're going to need to know where to go and how to do it. God is going to lead you into uncharted territory if we are willing to follow him. He will never lead you in that which feels comfortable and in that which you totally understand. And there's good reason he doesn't do that. Because if you could understand it, you would begin to figure it out and you'd begin to try to do it all on your own. When you're left in that realm of God, I, this is not making sense to me. We're left in total dependency upon him. And then we're able to see his power revealed. You 
going to move into uncharted territory, but follow the ark, but do so from a distance. And what that's referring to is a couple of things. First of all, revere the presence of God. Do not take the presence of God for granted. Even though he has promised to never leave us or forsake us, even though he promised he'd be there with us all the time, no matter what comes, do not take him for granted. And do not treat him as commonplace. Because in so doing, we can run into the realm where we begin to grieve the Holy Spirit of God. See, to the Jewish people, the Ark of the Covenant represented God's presence, and it was central to their worship. And God's presence has been made very personal to us through his Holy Spirit. And it must be the central focus of our lives. To be wherever he wants to lead. But can I tell you that we have to make sure of one very important fact. The presence of God was with them. Yet at the same time, it went before them. See, the Ark of the Covenant was with them, was it not? But that day, what, was, what were they supposed to do? When you see the ark move, when you see the presence of God begin to move, be with it. However, be a distance from it. See, what was happening is, in fact, he gives us a measurement. It says 2,000 cubits. Well, what the heck is a cubit? Basically an arm's length. If you were to run the actual length of this 2,000 cubits... You're basically looking at just shy of a thousand yards or ten football fields. Okay? So this ark was going to be a ways out there yet. But can I make, have us realize this? As much as God is with us, God has also gone before us. And anyone that's been a part of this process, you know, all the, the people that are going to be our counsel and um, our, our leadership, as you've been part of this, have we not seen this to be true? Have we not seen ourselves from the very first day that we went and talked with the individuals, how God has paved the way for us? How he has actually given us some favor here that we did not expect. And even to the point that, um, you, know, you know, I think even these pies, you know, we, we made the offer that how, we, we want to help serve. We want to be there however we can. And she had mentioned, in fact, during our meeting, some of the people that were there remember she was talking about pies. Well, I wasn't aware that it was... I had in my mind turkeys, pies, Thanksgiving. You know, how many else think that? You know, well, I got a call this week on Thursday. So how many pies do you guys bring in? <laughs> it's like... Oops, my bad. <laughs> you know, I misunderstood something. Like, okay, no problem. We, we actually had enough this time. But, um, but the thing is, this wasn't from the individual that we talked with. This had gone through a couple other channels since then. Okay, and but there's there's a level of welcoming. There's a level of favor God has given us that we should not take lightly. We should not take proudly. Or boastfully, but very humbly, that God has gone before us in all of this, and His presence is being made known. Let us treat it well. Let us represent Him well Amen. where we go, and so doing, revere Him. And then in the fifth verse, there He goes and says this, and this is key, and this is crucial, especially in these couple of weeks. Because like I said, we've only got one more week here and then we're over there. And I think this, is the ve this here is the very timely word for us. If you hear nothing else this morning, I want you to hear just these two words. Sanctify yourself. Consecrate yourself. Because that's what he says here in verse 5. You're getting ready to cross over, people. It's time for us to make the move. It's time for us to finally move into the promised land. But for this to happen, even before God even before his presence goes before us, even before the ark moves, even before the Levites put their feet in the water, what's got to happen first and foremost is you, each and every one of you, need to consecrate 
or sanctify yourselves. Why? For tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. If you don't sanctify yourself, this is going to go to your head. Make sure your heart is right. Make sure your spirit is online with his spirit. See, uh, when we think about these words of sanctification or consecration, it's a very loaded word. And in its very most basic definition, it would be to simply set yourselves apart. Right? But there's really three aspects to this. The first thing is this, cleanse yourselves. Search yourselves out, is what he was telling the Israelites. Make sure that there's nothing in you that could stand in the way of God speaking and working through you. You know, I'm reminded of the words of the psalmist, create me a clean heart. You know, take not your Holy Spirit from me. You know, search me, try me, right? Cleanse yourselves. And as you cleanse yourselves, as you make sure that your heart is lined up the best that it can be with God, then you need to come together in dedication. See, there had to be a level of unity. They couldn't decide half of them go this way, half of them go that way. They had to be united on all levels with this thing. They had to be equally devoted to seeing it come to pass. And then the third aspect is set yourselves apart. See, the setting yourselves apart comes after you've been able to cleanse yourself and you've been able to come together in the way that God has called you together. God called the Israelites together as one people. Many tribes, one people. God called us together, many families, into one congregation. But he wants us to move together, fully dedicated to him and to him alone and to his purpose. Amen? So set yourselves apart for that. Set yourselves apart. See, consecration will prepare you for the move of God. Without it, we will be unprepared. In fact, Ephesians 4, 22, uh, all the way into verse five, chapter 5, verse 1, basically tells us about the importance of putting off concerning our former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful and be renewed in the spirit of our mind that you can put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. And then he says, therefore, meaning now here's how you're going to do it. And he lists off a whole bunch of criteria, whether it be not lying, um, not letting the sun go down on your anger, um, not stealing, you know, and he goes through the whole list. And then comes back to another, therefore, chapter 5, verse 1, says, therefore, be imitators of God as dearly loved children. So it's understanding that in order for us to put off the old man and put on the new means we've got to imitate God on all levels. We've got to begin to really look like him. And that is part of that consecration process. When we go to this new location, we are not going, we do not want to go and put on any airs. We want to go and be the people God called us to be, however he calls us to do that. But what we've got to make sure of is that in everything that we do, we reflect Jesus. Amen. We reflect him in everything. And if we do, he's going to do great and marvelous things Amen. through that. What are those great and marvelous things? I don't have a clue. And I want to keep it that way. Because as long as I keep it that way, it keeps me dependent on him. It keeps you dependent on him. So let's go blindly together. Understanding that we're all following the same conductor and he knows exactly where we're going. Amen. All right? Amen. I might just be first trombone, okay? But we're all following the same conductor, okay? <laughs> Why? God wants to do amazing things. Are you ready for him to do some amazing things? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't, again, I don't claim to understand exactly what that's going to look like. But I know this much. Where God has had us for these last five years, we'll be starting our sixth year, interestingly enough, next month. Okay? God is moving us into the next chapter. We have been operating. We've been, we, God has really brought a great group of people together here. 
But you know what? The days are, I believe the days are done of just simply coming together and just growing together. God's moving us into a chapter where he wants us to move on the offensive, where we are going to take back territory that the enemy has stolen from this area for way, way too long. And God wants to use us as the mighty, powerful way if we will simply submit ourselves to him on every level. Are you ready to do that? Again, it's, it's not going to feel the same. It's going to be a lot different than just being like the Israelites, just kind of hanging out in the desert and letting God meet your needs and asking God to kind of meet you where you're at and being able to support one another and encourage one another. It's going to mean going in and taking down strongholds. It's going to mean really being able to face some giants because you know what? The people didn't change from Numbers chapters 13 and 14. It's the same land that they were going into that was filled with giants and people that, the, that uh, 11 others felt, we can't take them. We can't conquer this land. It was going to be a place that sometimes was going to stretch them. And where God's taking us at times is going to want to stretch us. But you know what? God said, I'll never leave you. And I will never forsake you. What does that mean? It means wherever I'm leading you, I'm leading you there to prosper you for the sake of my kingdom. And if I promise to do that, it will come to pass. As long as you don't get in the way. Amen. So be his instrument, but realize every instrument needs an instrument player. They're not meant to play themselves. Okay. So let him play you. Amen. Lord God, we thank you this morning. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for this incredible opportunity we have. Whatever this is going to look like, we look with great anticipation, much like the Israelites did, as they stayed there at the banks of the Jordan, knowing that things were going to change, things were going to shift, but it was all going to be good, and it was all going to glorify you in the end. Lord God, would you glorify your name through us as we move forward, as we revere your presence on every level. And we give you honor and praise in Jesus' name.